Hello and welcome to episode 63 of Full Court Press. My name is Chris Murphy. I'm a form sports reporter. The other two people can introduce themselves. Joel. I'm Joel Sipper. I'm kind of a goon, as Murphy would correct describe me. Anyways, I'm a sports reporter for WDAY. And, and, who, and who the hell are you? Me? Oh, I'm uh, Clay Cunningham. Um, I'm not quite sure how Murphy describes me. I'm still relatively new, but I'm a sports reporter. Behind your back, I say terrible things. Well, oh, no. Assumedly so. It's, it's a cutthroat industry, everybody. Every, that's just... Inside scoop: All journalists hate each other. Okay, this we do not hate each other. This is this is Clay Cunningham, somewhat new. Uh, he's the West Fargo guy. He's helping us out with the forum too. Um, also a sports reporter. So we're gonna talk about sports because that's all we're good for. Uh, and yeah, we're gonna start off with football. North Dakota football. Another week of football. I'm trying to see how many times I can say football in the same paragraph. <laughs> um, what did we learn this week, Joel? Let's start with North Dakota. Um, I already said that. Oh, you did? I said we're starting with North oh, Dakota. Okay. Sorry. Why do you got to do this? Um, I think one of the main things was Cheyenne kind of rebounding um, after losing into overtime into Century. And, Clay, you were at that game. I was. Uh, just tell us a little bit about it. What stuck out to you? Well, this is my, my first-hand account was that... Um, well, I, I think it was what, kind of what Cheyenne needed. I mean, obviously that week one loss was not... Certainly not a bad loss, but no, I mean, no. I mean, you force five turnovers on the road. I think you're going to expect to win. So, mm-hmm. the, so I think this is kind of what they needed to do against a legacy team that's not very good. I think it was kind of yeah. very clear from the start that this was going to be be a route. But I mean, they got the rushing game, they got the running game going at a, a 325 to 11 edge in the rushing affair after getting out rushed 246 to 37. Just the week 11 before. yards too. That's like yeah. Defense is stout. Yeah, yeah, they really got, I mean, the pass rush was dominant. That kind of impacted a lot. But, I mean, yeah, the run game was dominant. Parker Sander only threw five passes, but completed them all, including a couple of really nice touchdown passes. Efficient. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, uh, you shoot for 100% every week. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, that's, I mean, really not a whole lot to say. I mean, the 47-7 yeah. seven basically says it all. I think now this kind of is the most anticipated game in the Valley right now is Cheyenne versus West Fargo. Is this the year that the Mustangs get over the hump? I mean, they've gotten over the hump in other sports against West Fargo. They've shaken that little brother mantra where this is the final sport that they got to get over that. Uh, I mean, you've seen both teams. What do you think? Well, it's kind of like it seemed sort of odd. Like there was... Like sort of, I don't want to say pessimism. It was it was cautious optimism in the stadium with people. I'm hearing people talk about this game Friday because I, I I get You're saying it. cautious optimism from Cheyenne. From side. Cheyenne, yes. Like I, I think they were they didn't want to like dive right in. Yeah. And I, I get to the point like you look four meetings West Fargo four wins by 139 to 28 margin, mm-hmm. which I which I didn't it, know I didn't realize it was yeah. that yeah <laughs> it, it 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 jumps out but. It's. I, mean, I think last year was the first time in the last three years that Cheyenne actually scored. Yeah, two the straight, previous two, two straight matches shutouts. were shutouts, shutouts by the Packers. Wow. And I just kind of, I mean, I sort of get that, but I mean, four years is sort of a small sample size, and I just, based on what we've seen, I, yeah. Cheyenne's the better team. Like yeah. they, they it, it's. It is so interesting to see Clay. Like he start, he's starting right now, and so he's new to all yeah. this. He is so not used to the dominance of West Fargo well, that we, well, we're yeah. so used to. So like he, well, like even like to the JV, the JV teams for the Packers always dominated the Cheyenne too. It was kind of yeah, they kind of build off that foundation. So it's interesting to listen to a guy talk about that came like West Fargo just isn't that good when we're yeah. so used to just it being automatic that yeah. West Fargo football is great. And yeah, I mean, I think I think this is the year they win. And yeah, it's like the I, numbers speak for themselves this in year past Cheyenne years. Wins. But but mm-hmm. I mean, that's I think it's just I, I know that's kind of the, like in the talk with uh, Coach Gibson is just like kind of like you know getting to the point where you know they're they're good by yeah. by season's end. And but I think they got a ways to go. And I I I will be very surprised if West Fargo wins this game on Friday. Can I put in a shameless plug? Do it. Uh, we're going to be televising the game on WDAY. Actually, you can stream it on WDAY.com. Oh, really? Yep, and it's free, so I, I don't want any of the uh, the stream doesn't work. The stream works fine. Our broadcast team does an excellent job, and it's free. Good <laughs> lord, calm down, Joel. I, How many calls I, have you gotten? 
I, I'm fair <laughs> mullet. Clay will also be at that game, I will. and he will be having to fit into the press box. With it's going to be smashed with WDAY people. I just make a sure couple. Make sure you text at it or it, send an email ahead of time. Sure, it will there. be loud. It will be loud. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, I guess we know who's announcing. <laughs> uh, okay, but but just for the re- uh, just for record, Cheyenne is now ranked number three in the polls. Uh, Davies is in at number five. Uh, Jaden Claybo uh, got injured last week. Or this last last game, uh, it ended up being an MCL sprain, so he's out. Uh, he's also sorry, tight end, linebacker, uh, North Dakota State commit. He's out against Fargo North this week. Uh, they're hoping he's back for West Fargo Cheyenne, which is, I mean, not, not to get ahead of ourselves, are, are we thinking that Davies and Cheyenne are the two best in the so EDC? So far, um, South. I mean, South is interesting. Um, we'll see. They, they didn't play as much of a tougher non-conference schedule as you look at what. West Fargo, Cheyenne, and what Davies played. I mean, Davies, they play Bismarck and Minot. I mean, those are yeah. two of the heavy hitters in the East. Uh, Cheyenne, they play Century. Like you see, quite not up there, but I mean, it's still Bismarck school, and they're up there where you look at who South played. I believe last week they lost to Mandan for the first time ever. And is, then, the, is the West just, is it going to be automatic that the West is winning 3A? I mean, do we see anybody from... Uh, it's early in the season. I know, it's I super early. It's early in the season. It's traditionally, like, it, it, that's not going out on much of a limb. Like, you saw right. last year, you had the three West teams in the semifinals and then West Fargo. Um, the year before that, it was two West Fargo... Or it was not two West Fargo teams. It was two West teams in the championship. So, I mean, I'm yeah. the West is the class of 3A football. It's just who who's going to be there. Okay, uh, now let's move on to 2A. Uh, Joel, I believe you have some stuff on Shanley, who is now number two behind, of course, St. Mary's. So just kind of an interesting thing for uh, Cade Kuhneman this week is a kind of a painful one-year anniversary. So last year at this time, Shanley was out in Watford City, and this is kind of a thing like Class 2A football with it's statewide, and every week or so the team that gets to travel to Watford City, I mean, they're on the farthest they're the furthest west part of the state. Anyways, Kuhneman broke his collarbone at Watford City last year. And I was talking with him earlier this week. Um, it's an eight fu- it's an eight hour bus ride from Shanley to Watford City. So not only he breaks his collarbone, they give him a sling, and at the time they thought it was, there wasn't anything definitive yet that, all right, this kid clearly has a broken collarbone. But he was on a bus in a sling with no painkillers. For eight hours. Nice. For eight That's, hours. I and took like four painkillers before I, sitting in here. <laughs> <laughs> that's insane. And as someone who's broken their collarbone before, I mean, that's not the greatest feeling in the world. Your shoulder goes numb. And I think the thing that's kind of the kicker is whenever you try to move your shoulder, it's like two really rusty nails. Like it's about <laughs> as tetanus as you can get just rubbing and grinding against each other. That's kind of what it Good feels Lord. like. So it, it's not, I, I can't recommend having your collarbone <laughs> broken. It, Thank, it, you. Nightmare Thank like you for explaining. Yeah. What a nightmare, so, like railroad tracks. Yeah, would be like a, he almost, had to deal oh, with that dear. for eight hours on a bus. So okay, Shanley plays nice. Watford City at home this time, so I'm sure. There will, no the, be eight hour, there will not be an eight-hour bus ride for I'm him. I'm sure Kuhneman wants, uh, I guess, maybe not a little bit of revenge on his mind, maybe not like, go out and break kids' collarbones, but, <laughs> I mean, have I'm a very happy game. that you're not recommending yeah, to go yeah. break kids' collarbones. Central, so, yeah. Central Cast is number three. What do you got on them, Joel? This is just really surprising with Central Cast because they returned a lot of the pieces that they did last year, and last year they didn't play that well. Jonah Leeds, I don't know what it was, but he's taken a really big step this year. 290 yards and four touchdowns against Devil's Lake, who was previously the third-ranked team at the time, and Central Cast was fourth-ranked. And he becomes the school's all-time passing yards leader. I, Central Cass has really been one of the most surprising teams in North Dakota this year. Not just Class 2A, but just overall. And I think, too, I mean, you have to factor in how much that facilities upgrade really helped them out this year. Especially, that was their first game on the new turf. And then also, I mean, Central Cass at Jamestown, that should be another great game. Considering Jamestown had Shanley on the ropes and they only lost to them by one point. Interesting. Uh, then we got 1A, Hillsborough Central Valley is still number one, and then nine-man Thompson is number one. Uh, Joel, what do you got on Thompson? Uh, Thompson, they play. it's going to be a big Region 1 battle this week. Thompson versus Richland, both teams undefeated, both teams high-flying offenses. Uh, you look at the quarterbacks that Thompson has, Caden Schwabe and then Cole Myers, who lit up South Border to start the season. It's Richland's really interesting, too, considering what they, what's 
the history they've had the last seven months and I guess just kind of how they've been able to turn the page. Anything else to add on North Dakota side? Uh, that's all I got for North Dakota. All right, let's move on to Minnesota. Uh, I was at uh, the Morehead game. Were you at Morehead at all, Joel? I was not. Okay. I was in oh, that was, that was the one that was on TV. That was the one yep. that was on TV. Um, yeah, I was at Morehead, uh, Morehead Elk River. Uh, the opener for the Spuds. It was not good if you're a Spud head, Spud Spudhead fan. If you're a Spud fan, <laughs> um, I mean, El, if, if if Elk River is the best of Class Five A, um, and they really looked like it, uh, Moorhead has a long way to go. Uh, Spuds scored on the third play of the game. They forced a fumble on the next Elk River possession, and you were thinking maybe this team could be a surprise, but so absolutely, you're saying there's a chance. Absolutely not. Elk River just absolutely owned the line of scrimmage. They had two guys over. One one back was over 200, one back was over, like, one-something, and it was only on, like, 19 carries between both of them. Um, Ejibar, right? Yeah, I he was incredible. Name. He was incredible. Um, he Yeah, he was just absolutely – it's Kevin, Kevin Ejibar, yeah. And, yeah, um, they just – I mean, they just got dominated at, at the line of scrimmage. Uh, Spuds are looking for playmakers, plain and simple. They lost all of them last year. Riley Shock uh, can only do so much. It's hard to ask him to lead the linebackers on one side and then also lead the rushing attack, which he did. But he went down. He got hurt. Uh, Ali Yunus got, went down. Logan Garcia went down on, like, the third play of the game and was limping. Mm-hmm. They all seemed to come out healthy, but – uh, Spud's got a long way to go. Uh, the good news from it was Trey Feeney actually looked pretty comfortable at quarterback, and that's pretty good for a, a sophomore. A sophomore against one of the best teams in the season. Yeah, making class. his first start. Yeah, um, <clears throat> that that was a good sign for them. But I mean, they're going to need some playmakers. I mean, I, I'm already. I, I know this is kind of crazy already to look ahead, but I mean, they look like they might have a very good team next year and maybe the next year. I just don't know if this is the year. So yeah. that was from that game. The most surprising thing I felt from the entire week on the Minnesota football side, and Joel, you were at this game, yep. was uh, Barnesville beating DGF considering it was on the road and considering how injured Barnesville was. How did they do it, Joel? Uh, just starting with, I guess, how the game started off to begin with, both offenses marched down right right down the field and scored. One thing that was interesting with DGF was we were talking with Soderberg before the season, and he was saying, we're going to look to spread the ball around a little bit more and, like, that was kind of something like, all right, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll believe be- it when I see it. I'll believe it when I see it, and they actually did that. They, there was a lot of times you saw bubble screens. Um, you saw them throwing to the perimeter a lot in the first half. But one thing that really killed DGF was, I believe there was under four minutes to go in the first half. Um, DGF had the ball on their 10-yard line. Aiden Leach completed a pass for, for 40 yards. So you're thinking here, they got three minutes to go. They're at the 50. They can get a score before half. They can really kind of grab the momentum going into that, and then... They fumbled the snap, which kind of killed all the momentum. Barnesville wasn't able to score. But coming out of that in the second half, there was another play, too. DGF was on its own 10-yard line. They fumbled, and then sure enough, next play, Nick Detloff runs it in, gives Barnesville the lead, and they don't look back. I mean, another thing that was surprising, too, was how well Barnesville rushed the football. 252 yards compared to 43. Barnesville absolutely owned the second half, scoring 22 unanswered points, and their offensive line and the rushing tack was a big reason why. And kind of an interesting tweak, too, that Barnesville made this year was their offense looked kind of similar to what Elk River does. So I know Barnesville traditionally runs wing T, so they kind of tweaked it a little bit. Where Triple option, so it was three in the back? They had three, yep, they had three in the backfield. Interesting. And it, yeah, and I mean, Barnesville, they got some size on their offensive line, and I mean, the running backs are kind of the perfect size. Did you the, watch Elk River run that thing? It was just I, like And that's the thing, too. As a cameraman, yeah. uh, I'm sorry, like, media begins with me kind of thing here. If you're shooting highlights I, on the sideline, you are going to get burned. Like, there's so many things. I thought about that because, like, legitimately Elk River would be running a play, and I'd be writing down the stats. Like, yeah. And I'd be writing down, all right, 27 just ran for three. And then 31 would be running for a 30-yard yeah. touchdown because I didn't know who they gave yeah. the ball to. I was like, oh, like, it, was, yeah. it was amazing. The only safe way to shoot it is if you're shooting from the stands. And if you're at a busy place, or not a busy place, but if you're at a stadium that doesn't have that much seating and, and the stands are already packed and you get there late, it's kind of like, well, I'm going to try my luck at this. I, and I, I couldn't blame I could hear Dom announcing the wrong guy with the, <laughs> with the, with the ball. And I, I didn't blame him because I thought the same thing. I was like, all right, 27 got three yards. Oh, no, I, 31 just got 13. It's yeah. like... I mean, but the amazing. way that Barnesville ran the wing tee to begin with, I had, I mean, there's been times where I've gotten faked out, and then now they kind of add that element, too. I mean, that adds another element to their offense. And, two, um, Adam Tonsfeld, who was supposed to be their quarterback, but 
broke his thumb in a scrimmage against Park Rapids. I mean, he was the perfect type for a quarterback, too. I mean, he can, I think he's about 5'9", five, 5'10". Five, he can sneak underneath that offensive line, and it's hard to tell where the ball's going. So who, who was injured say. for Barnesville? So they it was a, their star running back. Yep, Jackson Wall, who's a sophomore that had the big game against Holly. And yeah. uh, I don't know when he's coming back. It might not even be till the last week of the regular season or playoffs. I mean, he has a partially torn ACL. Um, you, you really couldn't tell. Preston Snowball um, took over under center to begin with. He got, I mean, he's playing both sides of the ball. He was playing quarterback and defensive end, and he's not a kid that really shies away from contact, so he got dinged up a little bit. Not too bad, but Strand had Sam Asgard in at quarterback for kind of a drive or two just to give him some relief in the third quarter. Um, it's, I was just really impressed by Barnesville to have the injuries that they've had, and to beat a team like DGF, DGF is still a quality team. I think thing, there's some things they need to work on, but uh, Barnesville really impressed me. That's a that's a bad sign for how Barnesville how, how Barnesville played is a bad sign for Holly and for and it's a good sign. Well, how DGF played is a good sign for Perham, mm-hmm. but for back to Holly, Holly got rolled by Manoman Wabin. Yep. Uh, walk me through that game. Joe. I was at the first half of that game and just kind of the sense. I mean. Holly said a little, a little bit in their nuggets. They wanted to spoil the party because that was the first ever home game for Minoman Wabin. And Minoman Wabin, I, Holly had a really hard time slowing him down. Uh, I think it was the first drive of the game. Uh, John Starkey rips off a 52 yard run up the middle. And that backfield, I know we look at it on paper, but the first time I saw it in person, i just absolutely blown away with John Starkey and Parker Severson. I mean, you have two quarterbacks. You're wondering how it's going to work with Parker Severson kind of going back to running back this year. And just the vision that they have in the cuts. I, I can only, like, being quarterback for so many years, how much that's really benefited them. And, I mean, this was a two-way team they were going Yeah. It's like they won't, they'll, yeah. they're a one-way team. And Starkey, I mean, rushing for 206 yards and three rushing touchdowns. Parker Severson, 160 yard, 161 yards and a touchdown. Um, Minoman Wabin only threw the ball four times. They didn't complete that. They didn't need to. They don't need to. I, to their offensive line, even though they're young, they were absolutely impressive. They That's the frightening thing is that they're all pretty yeah, young. Yeah, they like, controlled the line of scrimmage. And, and Holly's no slouch either. No, and, Holly's going to be good. And think, what they did, I will say that game might be a little bit different if Jacob Vetter plays quarterback because obviously um, Chick Le- Chase Leibach looked pretty good in his debut under center. I will say, though, when he's a better wide receiver and quarterback. And he, he admitted that to me. He likes playing wide receiver more than quarterback, but um, he's such a threat on the outside, and you take one of those threats, and you have to have him under center. They can move, they can pass the ball, but... If, Who are you throwing it to? Yeah. yeah it, 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 once they get bit, better back, it'll be really interesting to see. Okay, so that's that. Uh, Perham, on the other hand, uh, rolled Frazee, who Frazee was back after not yep. having varsity football. Uh, that was a 50 to eight win. Ty Mosier became this, uh, Perham's all-time leading uh, uh, receiver in touchdown receptions with his 14th. Also, a cool moment was uh, Perham delivered a Letterman's jacket to classmate Quentin Schumacher, who was uh, who has cerebral palsy and is in a wheelchair. I wrote a story about him this summer as uh, Perham quarterback Jensen Beachy surprised him with a Perham football jersey with Schumacher's name on the back for his senior pictures. Uh, Beachy and Schumacher go way back since middle school. Beachy, wanted, Beachy actually wanted to get him a letterman's jacket for the senior pick, but he couldn't get the money together in time. So Perm surprised Quentin uh, the day of the first game with one. Very cool story. I, my, one of my favorite quotes Beachy had in the story from the summer was, I have the attitude that I'm, going to, I'm not going to walk past anyone and, and ignore the fact that they're there. Um, so I thought that was a very cool story. Uh, I know WDY did a story on it yesterday. Kevin did, yep. yeah. Um, it's just a great story. It's just like I, you, you hear so much about like athletes, a athletes being jerks, teenagers being jerks, and then you see stuff like this, and yeah. it's like you know there are other people too. It right? kind of gives you the sense too. I mean, that the power of sports, so what it can do, as far as building yeah. I mean, leadership, community kind of sense. And there's so many things we take for granted. I mean, we take for granted having a jersey or having a Letterman's jacket. Yeah, I and mean, this is all this kid wanted and yeah it's just a great story um and then but anyway 
So yeah, Perm still Perm, Perm still looks good. Uh, are you still sticking Joel with Perm versus DGF and Holly versus Barnesville for those sections? Yeah, yeah. I, I think I don't think I haven't else. seen East Grand Forks play yet, but I believe they play at DGF. They got DGF this week. Um, Julian Benson, who made his first career start as a junior, who made his first career start, he was pretty impressive when East Grand Forks beat Crooks, and I think he had four touchdowns as the Green Wave won, 49 to 28. Something to keep an eye on. I. You know, they might be able to be a dark horse in that section, but as of now, it's Perm and DGF in my eyes. Okay. Um, another surprise from the week was uh, Detroit Lakes beating Ricori 40-19. Uh, Detroit Lakes gets Perm this week. Lakers rushed for 300 yards in uh, that game, getting 211 from junior Isaiah Thompson, who is also the only Detroit Lakes wrestler to have a state championship. I, I think that's really interesting. You look at Detroit Lakes, what's really, the last couple of years, what's been that one obstacle that they've faced? And it's always been a team like Ricori or or Wilmer, right, in right. that in that section, and kind of playing off that. I mean, that's not a good week for Ricori because you had Eric Decker to retire. Oh, yeah, it's uh, tough. Nah, it's not tough. a tough week. It's gonna be all right. All right. Well, <laughs> you, you got anything else for Minnesota football? Uh, that that's pretty much it for me. All right. What else do we have on the other stuff? Uh, uh, other sports. Do Clay, I know you talked a little bit about Davies cross country last week. Touched on it a little bit. Was there more that you wanted to add this week? Um, I, it's just basically. More of the same. I mean, they went to that uh, the originals with two R's in <laughs> Jamestown race and uh, dominated. I mean, all five of their scores in the top 20. Um, just uh, I think a big thing, um, um, the uh, feature story I wrote about them this week, um, available to read at inforum.com. Shameless plug. There yeah, we go. Absolutely. <laughs> was uh, that they didn't have a single runner in the top 10 preseason poll. Yeah. Which is kind of, you know, the fact, I mean, I think they were the clear cut number one. Yeah, absolutely. A- after one race, uh, they, uh, Megan Lundstrom finished third in that original. She's now number two. That mm. seems, that was one seems heck a of little a jump. wishy washy <laughs> with the, yeah. the, the polling. Uh, the thing that jumped out to me, like, to go back to that race was um, to stick to, you know, my beat, uh, West Fargo. Uh, was second at that race. They were 84 points ahead of Grand Forks Central, who um, I think we'll remember tied Fargo Davies atop the scoreboard at the state race last year right. and then lost on the tiebreakers. That's kind of an impressive showing there. And yeah, West Fargo that moved them up to number three in Class A. So that's something to watch. But um, but to build on, yeah, that Davies is uh, good. But, yeah. <laughs> Davies is good. <laughs> yeah, welcome, welcome to the area. Thanks, Davies yeah. is really good at running. Um, speaking of Davies, uh, Davies Volleyball, uh, I believe one of you wants Undefe- to speak about that. Yeah, undefeated so far this season. 8-0 overall and 2-0 in the EDC. I mean, they have a potential first place match going up here at Cheyenne, September 13th. I got a chance to see Cheyenne. I, I have, I'll admit, I haven't been to many volleyball games so far this year. There'll, there'll be more as the season goes on. I was at Shanley Cheyenne last night. Cheyenne looks... I. They look like they've made some improvement so far, and you'll see that in the record. They're 3-0 in the EDC, and Shanley is a team traditionally, too, that's been one of the powers when it comes to volleyball, so that should be interesting coming up here to see how, how Cheyenne does, it, if they can compete as far as the top spot in the EDC. It was interesting, because, yeah, having not been here, like, you know, I obviously don't know the history, which I feel yeah. like I should, eventually I'm going to be able to stop prefacing uh, every <laughs> statement I make with that. <laughs> but, but that's, not from here. <laughs> yeah, but that's, uh, I think there there was a lot of optimism around them, because I knew they only lost one senior last yeah. year, and who wasn't, like, a huge contributor. I think, mm-hmm. like, sort of, you know, losing anyone who, who plays at all. But, yeah, they brought a lot back, and... I think that was an interesting team to look at. And I'm going to be, I mean, assuming that they can, you know, win. They got Fargo North uh, the 6th, which is the day after we record this. And then mm-hmm. they've got Grand Forks Central on the 11th. So there's still a couple of EDC matches going in. But that would be very I mean, interesting to see how that plays out. Both of them appear very winnable. I was going to say, Cheyenne, look, looking at that, Cheyenne has a really good chance to go 5-0 and to start its EDC schedule. Yeah, that, I think that could be an interesting match uh, next Thursday. What would you? Who, what? Give me your early predictions. We'll have another show, but right now, what's your prediction? The guy, the I've, the guy I've just said he hasn't two, seen any volleyball. I've only <laughs> seen one match. Okay. Well, I, a... To me, though, on paper, this is on paper. So any hate mail, please send to uh, cmurphy at formcom. Dot com. Formcom. Dot com. There we go. That one. There's but, two M's in the first com. 
But uh, I would say Davies. Davies is kind of the one that kind of jumps out to me. So there's going to be like fat heads like with you with like a circle and a dash through it and the, the Cheyenne. We're going to try and get as many sections. predictions out of you as possible so oh, student <laughs> sections can chant at <laughs> Absolutely. You. Okay, uh, I believe you guys have some soccer to also speak about. So Boy soccer, that is. Like literally a day after we were talking about how good West Fargo is and they lost to South 3-2. to two. Uh, That's kind of... A, a surprise to me. I mean, from you, I mean, you've gotten a little bit of a taste from soccer so far. What do you think on um, as far as the EDC scene? Uh, well, we outright, I think, openly declared that this was basically a two-team race between Davies and West Fargo. We recorded I, this a day after they tied. I do recall. And I, then, yeah, coming. I like, was there. <laughs> I I was very surprised by that final. I don't. I've not seen Fargo South in person, but I yeah. know. I mean, opening here with four straight ties, which yeah. even in soccer is bizarre. That is tough to do. But I, so traditionally, too, I think is one of those teams that kind of flies under the radar, but I think people overlook for a little bit, and sure enough, just kind of said, hey, I mean, we're capable, too. But and then, uh, but Davies turned around and beat Fargo South 3-2 to two last week, so does that now make them the sole front runner? Give us your prediction. Oh, my God. Stop I, making predictions. It, it's still Davies and West <laughs> Fargo. <laughs> South is kind of a nice us. surprise. They have a chance to net, maybe knock off a Davies or West Fargo later, but I still need to see more from the rest of the EDC before I say someone else besides West Fargo and Davies is the best team or the team to team to beat. I can respect that. But that's, at, a good, that's a good PR answer. At, I, th- at this <laughs> point a week ago, it looked to me like Grand Forks Central was like a surprise team. I don't think I openly declared it on the air. No. So no. so just know I don't just spew incompetence. I, I have incompetent you, thoughts too. Because West, Far- West Fargo turned around and beat them 7 to nothing last night. Well, so. there goes that. I'm yeah. sure they were angry when they Not played. A, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I, I, so, I don't worry. So. Nobody listens to this. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> okay, one more thing. I just wanted to get to some golf. Uh, West Fargo Cheyenne's uh, Maggie Madison is uh, Still ranked number one uh, for EBC Golf. Lily Brendemeyer, Joel? Brendemeyer. Brendemeyer is uh, number two for Red River. And then Shanley's uh, Greta MacArthur is number three. And Fargo North's Tanya Berg is number four. Locally, MacArthur just beat Manson at the Fargo North invite, but then Manson came around and beat her at the Grand Forks Red River invite. Mm -hmm. So that's where we're at in golf. That is all I have. Do you guys have anything else you'd like to add? I thought we really stuck the landing last week by making jokes about Joel's golf game. Do we have any... See, I don't golf, so I can't even make fun of you anymore. Yeah, come on. I I don't really golf. I'll be honest, though, too. I mean, my golf game makes fun of itself. I mean... (laughs) (laughs) That's, That's very good. Hey, Joel... What's the difference between you and oh, the worst man. golfer in the world? Oh, my God. Uh, uh, what? Virtually nothing. <laughs> okay, on that note. Uh, Home run. Okay, we're done. Okay, on that, on that note, we are going to leave now and try and not do as terrible next time. Thank you for listening. I make no promises. Goodbye.